Hey, good morning, everybody. Shall we all stand as we worship God this morning? Lost I say Of your great name, all condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and the world will praise your great name your great name all the weak find their strength at the sound of your great souls receive grace at the sound of your great name the fatherless they find their strength at the sound of your great name the sick are here that are raised at the sound of your great name Jesus worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us Son of God and man you are high and lifted up and all the world will Praise your great name, your great name, Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, Defender, my Savior, you are my King, Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, Defender, my Savior, you are my King. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, Son of God and man. You are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. Your great name, your great name, your great name, Jesus, where is the Lamb that 
I was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name. Your great
pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only greater you are It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Greater, we pour our praise to you. Greater, you Lord. Good morning, everyone. Great, as always, just to be together, to pour forth worship and praise, just to worship our great and awesome God. We have some announcements, so I will call your attention to those. They're in the bulletin, uh, so you can certainly follow along there. Uh, Today, after uh, the worship service, we'll have our usual virtual fellowship time Uh, on Zoom. So if you're interested in that, then you can certainly join that and just uh, enjoy the time being together just as brothers and sisters in the Lord and and just to delight in fellowshipping and communing with one another. Uh, Also, uh, coming up this week on Friday, we have our Friday night small group, and they will be meeting on Zoom as they have been, uh, and they're meeting at 7.30 p.m. on this Friday. So if you're interested, you can check that out and and join them for that. Uh, Also, coming up Next uh, Sunday before the service at 9.30 a.m., we will have our usual adult Sunday morning small group that will be here at the church down below in the fellowship hall for all who are interested. And then after that, of course, we will have our usual worship service, 10.30 a.m., right here in the sanctuary for those who are uh, able and and desiring to come. For those of you who are still staying at home, still a little hesitant and cautious, that's fine. We'll have it online as well, streaming live online for you guys as well. Uh, Also, uh, a note regarding the offering, we're not going to be passing the plates around as sort of we historically have done, just to avoid extra contact. So for those of us who are here in the sanctuary, we have uh, an offering plate at the back table. As you're on your way out after the service, you can just drop your gift in there. Uh, If you're watching this online, you guys can mail your gift in, and we would be greatly blessed by that. Uh, Also, uh, we have our visitor card here, so if we have anyone new and uh, someone who's visiting with us, we'd love for you to fill that out. You can tear it off. It's at the bottom of the bulletin there. You can tear that off and drop it in the offering plate on your way out. Uh, If you're new and you're visiting and you're watching online, we would just love for you to make some little note there in the comments. Just say, hey, I'm new, Uh, you know, first time watching the services, Uh, love to find out more about the church, and and we'll we'll certainly get in touch with you if you just make a little note there in the comments in the live stream worship service. Uh, So if that's you, please do that. We'd love to to further connect with you. And then just one more announcement, or not so much an announcement, but really more of a a thank you. I I wanted to call a little bit of attention to Richard and Dave. They've just faithfully been serving here at the church in the midst of this pandemic. I know we've sort of started gathering here. There's some of us here, some of us online. But for two months straight, as we were doing all of our our services online, 
Uh, each and every Sunday, Dave and Richard were just faithfully here leading worship, as Richard always does. Uh, Dave running all the tech at the back, even if you haven't seen him in the picture, he's been here every Sunday. Uh, and they've been here making it possible for us to be able to have these worship services and stream them live online for everybody to, to be able to participate in. And so I'm just grateful to them for, for their faithful service, serving God, serving this church. And I just want to say thank, thank you to them on behalf, not just of myself, but of the whole congregation, all of us here at New Hope Chapel. We're just grateful for you guys and your service here at New Hope Chapel. And just as a little, yeah, we can give them a round of applause as well. Thank you, guys. Just as a little token of our appreciation, I have a little card here and a little gift. You guys can come up if you're able. I don't know if Dave's able to or not. He's running the tech, so, but, but if you're able, you can come on up here. You can do the mass thing or not either way, but, but just wanted to say thank you to you guys and, and give you guys a hug. We're, we're grateful for you and just uh, how you guys serve us each and every Sunday and, and do so um, just faithfully. And Dave as well. Thank you, and I really just appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. Man. Thank you, guys. And, and certainly there's... I'm here every week, too, as well. That is true. And, and certainly there's so many others who, who have just serve here faithfully, even, um, you know, thinking of Sunday school, even though we haven't had that in the midst of all this stuff in the pandemic, just thinking of, you know, each and every Sunday, sort of our normal Sundays, and, you know, we got people downstairs doing children's ministry. We have ushers, and we have greeters. There's just so many other people. I don't want you guys to think like, oh, what about me? I've been serving. We certainly recognize you all as well, but I just wanted to call special attention to, to Richard and Dave and and uh, just thank them. So we're going to take some time now just to come before the Lord in prayer. Uh, and, and just a little announcement, something we're going to pray for. It's not listed in the bulletin as our family of the week or anything. Uh, but Sharon's mom is finally going to be having her kidney transplant. I know we've sort of known about that. We can clap for that too. That's a wonderful thing. Certainly just give God thanks and praise that that's finally happening. It, it happening. It's sort of been on hold a little bit with the coronavirus and, and whatnot. But it's going to be happening Tomorrow at 2 p.m., I'm betting that that's their time rather than our time, so probably that would be tonight in the middle of the night sometime. Uh, but either way, whether it's 2 p.m. our time or their time, um, it'll be tomorrow, 2 p.m., and so we just want to take some time just, just to pray. Give God thanks that, that that's happening. I know it's been sort of a long time coming, um, and just thank him for that, but also just pray that it would all go smoothly, that it would all go well, uh, and be effective as well, that, that she... Uh, would certainly have great effect from that new kidney and wouldn't be needing the dialysis or anything that she's been having regularly. So let's just come before the Lord and, and pray. Lord God, we are grateful to, to be your people, just to be here Sunday morning, to draw near to you, enter into your presence and, and just worship and, and praise, Lord. Praise you, our great and glorious God, and oh, what a joy it is, what a delight. Lord, we just thank you for every blessing that we have in you that is just a glorious, gracious gift. Lord, we do want to pray for Sharon, first we, for, for Sharon's mom. First, we want to just thank you. What, what a blessing it is that this transplant surgery is going to be happening tomorrow. I know that they've been waiting for this, and, and she just has been in terrible health, not feeling well, going through the dialysis treatments, which we're grateful for those, but uh, just has been struggling with kidney failure as a result of, of diabetes, and um, we're grateful that, that, that now this is taking place and, and that you have brought this to pass, Lord. Thank you for that kindness, that graciousness, and we just want to pray that, that the surgery would go well and smoothly, there wouldn't be any complications, that it would just sort of be textbook and, and as simple as possible, a kidney transplant, that, that she would receive the kidney well, that there wouldn't be any rejection, uh, no, not just complications in, in the surgery, that there wouldn't be any, but even afterward, that, that she would receive the kidney, that it would be effective, that it would do its job, uh, and that it would just be such a great blessing to her, Lord. And uh, so we just pray for that. We pray for that it would go well for, for wondrous healing of this transplant, Lord. We do also want to pray for our country, certainly the last, uh, I would say, couple weeks. In fact, even the last number of months, Lord, have just been um, tough months for, for our country, for the world, with uh, the coronavirus pandemic. But then even as that has sort of begun to, to subside and we're sort of starting coming out of that, then 
uh, just everything over the last couple weeks with the, the death of George Floyd and then uh, everything resulting from that and, and protests, some peaceful, some violent and, and rioting. And, uh, there's just a lot of upheaval and, and hurt and, and brokenness, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you would bring healing, Lord, and that your church would just faithfully be your church in the midst of it and lead the way. And uh, just, uh, Lord, do your thing and bring peace and wholeness as you do. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Shall we, shall we all stand as we prepare our hearts for his word?
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Be seated. So today for the sermon, as you may remember, we've been in this series, a uh, series really looking at, at really whatever I feel the Holy Spirit has just sort of laid on my heart to share. That's sort of the theme for this series, recognizing that, that at times the Holy Spirit just he certainly guides and directs, and, and I just sort of felt his leading to sort of just be really tuned into him, and, and that he had things that he wanted me to, to really be speaking about and, and sharing on, and so instead of just sort of picking a book of the Bible or some specific theme like a, a marriage series or whatnot to say, no, you know, I'm just going to follow the, the Holy Spirit's leading, and He has things He wants me to share and talk about, and, and to really just be faithful to that, and, and as He leads, just to preach on those things. Uh, and, and really, I'd say it's, it's perfect timing, as of course you'd expect. It's the Holy Spirit and His leading. And I just think of our, our country and, and really the, the situation that we're in, and just sort of all that has, has taken place over the last couple weeks, really um, going back to Memorial Day and, and the death of, uh, of George Floyd, and, and then sort of thinking of all that has sort of flowed out of that. Uh, and we'll sort of talk about that a little bit and dive in. Uh, you know, just as a warning, I'm not going to get overly political about that. Don't think that that's where this is going. And this is Pastor Steve's sort of political agenda on all of this matter. But really what I want to do is sort of take a look at it and say, let's really get to what is most fundamentally at the heart of of all of the brokenness that we see as we sort of look at our country, as we see all of the brokenness and say, what in the most fundamental and basic sense is the problem? And then to say, well, if we have this, this real fundamental problem, what, what's the solution, right? Who's the solution? What's the solution? And take a look at that. And as we're going to see, Christ is the only kind of recap a little bit. Again, I'm not going to get into all the details. I know it's been all over the news and, and everywhere and so forth. But over the past couple of weeks, we certainly sort of start off with, with George Floyd and, and sort of all that went down there, all that took place, and certainly a, a, a tragic death and something that ought not to have taken place. Uh, you know, yes, there was some initial difficulties and in resisting of arrest, but by the time he was on the ground, there was no more resisting. He wasn't pushing back. He wasn't fighting. Uh, and the police there had clearly subdued him. Uh, and yet, for, for no reason, his neck was, was you know, put in, the knee of the officer was put on his neck, uh, preventing the ability to breathe and, and breathe sufficiently. Uh, and, and again, no need for that knee to be there for eight-ish minutes straight, again, with, with the person already subdued and, and, and handcuffed and, and, and dealt with. For that, certainly uh, wrong was done. There was brutality that shouldn't have taken place. And, and, and there are charges that have been brought. And, just so, uh, and, and so certainly it's great to see in that aspect that there's justice that is being pursued and so forth. But, but the story doesn't end there. It's not like that took place and that's the end of the story. We certainly see brokenness taking place there as we see that police officer. Uh, I'll sort of leave the other three police officers who are involved sort of out of it for, for, for simplicity's sake. But as we see a police officer acting in, in brutality toward, toward this person and, and ultimately snuffing out his life and sort of the brokenness and the horror of that and that murder. But, but again, the story doesn't end there. But then there are protests that result and some of it peaceful, but of course, uh, certainly plenty of it that was not peaceful peaceful, and that was all over the news night after night after night. Is, uh, you know, it's not just one city, but cities all across the country, and, and in fact, it even spanned, you know, went beyond the U.S. and in other places. I know London and, and other places where there were protests, and again, not just peacefully, but, but even violently in certain ways as well, uh, where there's been rioting, there's been looting, you know, cash registers, stores looted, you know, pillaged, cities set ablaze. Uh, I've seen video after video of, of whether it's store owners or others just brutally beaten senselessly. Uh, people have been shot. They've been killed. There have been deaths as a result of this. And you sort of take a look at it. And I'm not saying that there aren't things that are going on on, on the surface level as well. But if you sort of look and say what's really most fundamentally the problem, what's most basically going on here, what is the cause of all of this? And the answer, and the biblical answer to it, is man's sinfulness, 
Man's depravity, man's evil. It's just the reality of mankind. It's who we are. It's sort of the bad news that, that a lot of people don't want to be confronted with, right? Our world sort of doesn't want to look at mankind and say that mad, mankind is just utterly and totally depraved and sinful and evil. Our, our culture sort of wants to look at man and paint this picture of, of we're mostly good. Yeah, okay, they'll admit, you know, we mess up, we sort of slip up, we make mistakes at times, but, but we're sort of inherently good, uh, and it's just every now and then you, you get people who are particularly corrupt and so forth and do, do evil. But I'd say, no, that, that's not the, the picture of, uh, that the Bible paints, and it's just not the p- picture of, of, of reality, as Scripture, of course, is true, and we see this playing out in our country before our eyes, that man is thoroughly and totally and completely evil and depraved and sinful. And this goes all the way back to that first act of rebellion. Of course, God created man, and he created man good and perfect, but it didn't stay that way for all too long. It didn't take too long before Adam and Eve right, decided that, hey, no, we're not going to follow God in his way. We're going to do our own thing. Even though he said, don't eat this fruit from this tree, we're going to go. We're going to do that. We're going to rebel against him. And ever since then, the reality is man has been steeped in evil and rebellion. And that plays itself out in a whole host of different ways. Whether you look at the situation and a murderous act, you know, no regard for human life, acting in, in, in violence toward a fellow man and kneeling on his neck and, and again, you know, sucking the life out of him and committing murder. Whether it's people who now, even if they're claiming it's about justice, yet what are they doing? They're pillaging cities. They're... they're, they're businesses, they're setting them ablaze, they're committing acts of violence and, and, and murdering people as people have died in the protests and the riots. Uh, not to say there aren't those who are protesting peacefully, there, there are, but there are many who are violent in their actions. And what we see here is man's sinfulness just on display for the world to see. At times man can be a little bit better at, at sort of covering things up and sort of putting makeup in a sense on who we are and, and sort of covering up our, our sinful nature. At times we can be a little bit good and skilled at doing that. But, but at the heart of it, we are deeply sinful people, again, going all the way back to Adam and Eve and their act, that first act of rebellion toward the Lord. And so what we see here, and we see it not just in the situations of the last couple of weeks, we see it day after day in our world. It doesn't have to be the last two weeks where you could turn on the news and you're going to hear about the latest murder or the latest rape in, in your area and so forth and so on. It's just time after time after time we hear of man's sinfulness on display. And this is just the reality, again, going back to Adam and Eve. And this is what we see at work, right? This is what we see at work in, in our country, in our lives right before us, that man is evil. As we think of what is the problem, what's going on here, again, it's not to say that we can't be more specific and sort of flesh things out and look a little more at the surface levels, but most fundamentally, the problem is us. That's the reality. We're we're the problem. Man and our evil, our sinfulness, we're the problem. We've created all of this brokenness in our world, every bit of it, because of our sinfulness, because of our rebellion toward the Lord. Right? And so as we look at this and we say, well, we have this, this horrible problem before us, this problem of sin. We are utterly depraved, and we're going to take a look at, at Scripture and what Scripture says about that. But then we ask the question, well, if we have this horrible problem, right, we, we'd love to solve it. What is the solution? And again, I'd say sort of our world's mindset is, well, we're the solution, right? Uh, if we just all come together, if we all just sort of uh, apply ourselves and work at it, we can just make this wonderful, perfect world. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for sort of coming together and collaborating and, and seeking peace, and I'll, I'll talk about that, certainly. But, but fundamentally, we're not the solution. God can certainly work through us as part of the solution in various ways, and as I said, I'll talk about that. But fundamentally, we're not the solution. We're the problem. Right? We're, we're the ones with the sinful nature, the problem that has caused all of this brokenness. And in fact, we're not the solution, right? Rather, it is God himself, it is Christ himself, who is the only solution to this problem of sin. The problem of our, of our true wickedness and evil and sin, Christ is the only solution. And that's what we see in Scripture. And that's what I want us to take a look at here. So we sort of see all that's been going on in our country to, to recognize just the real sinfulness of mankind and to recognize that we're not the solution. It is God. It is Christ who's the solution. So let's take a look at some scriptures. First, I want to sort of establish, establish the fact that, that this really is the, the fundamental aspect of all that we see on display before us in our country, and that scripture is quite clear about man and his nature and his heart and, and what it's like. And first, I want to turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And here's what it says, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only 
evil continually. Right? Now, you might look at this and say, you know, okay, well, Genesis 6, let me try to think about that. that that's the story of Noah, right, and the flood, and this is sort of, you know, the status of, of the earth before the flood. That's correct, you know, so you might be thinking, well, was that just then, and that, that, you know, that's not now, things are different. I'd say, yes, that was then, but nothing has changed. Man is still the same old man. And what was man like? It says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Nothing's changed. You can look at our world now and say, the wickedness of man is great in the world. The wickedness of man is great in America and all over the, the world. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Again, this isn't like man's mostly good, but we just slip up every now and then. No, this is man is just steeped in evil. He is utterly, totally, and completely evil and in rebellion toward the Lord. And, and it's not like, oh, I, I just found one passage in Scripture, and this is the only one that illustrates this complete depravity and sinfulness and wickedness of mankind. It's all over the place. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 9, here's what it says. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. And the word they're used for desperately sick really has sort of the connotation of so sick in the sense of like incurable. It's like it's so desperately sick, it's incurable, right? Can't be fixed, can't be healed. The heart of man is more deceitful than all else and incurably sick, incurably diseased. Who can understand it, right? This is man's heart. Who are we on the inside, right? We're, we're more deceitful. We're more sinful. Man's heart that, than all else, right? Our hearts are desperately sick with sin, incurably sick. Christ can cure it, right? There, God can cure it, but, but on our own, incurably sick. That's the state of, of man's sinful heart. Who can understand it? it, it the sense there is sort of, it's like the, the depth of, of the wickedness of man's heart, it's just, it's unfathomable. It, it goes beyond comprehension, Again, not like we're a little sick in certain ways. We're not perfect. No, we are desperately, incurably sick, unfathomably sick. That is man's heart condition. Right? And David gets it. He writes in Psalm 51, verse 5. Here's what David writes, King David. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David understood his, his sin condition. He understood that it, it went back to, to the beginning of his existence. He was sinful from, from birth. And in fact, no, hey, I'll back up even further. From the very beginning of my existence, from the time I was conceived, my heart was filled with sin. David understands that. And that is the truth for each and every one of us, again, ever since the fall. From the very moment we came to be, from the very moment of, of our conception, what was our heart like? Like Jeremiah chapter 17 Verse 9, more deceitful than all else, desperately and curably sick, who can understand it? And so we see in Scripture, it's quite clear that this, this is the problem, right? We have this great problem, this problem of sin. And again, that's what we see on display before us as we look at our country and, and certainly the desperate times that we're in. We just see sin playing out, murder, riots, all of it, hate. Uh, just the destruction, looting, stealing, you name it, the violence. We just see man's sinfulness. We're told all over Scripture we shouldn't be surprised. We should still be sort, of, sort of have a sense of shock uh, as we see evil play out before us and have a sense of horror over it. But at the same time, shouldn't be some great surprise. We're, we're told in Scripture this is who man is. This is man's heart condition. This is who we are in our heart of hearts. We are desperately sick, and that's what we see on display before us in our country. And so we have this great problem, and the natural question is to say, what's the solution? Can we fix this, right? Whether it's all that's gone on over the last couple of weeks, but, but there was brokenness in our world before that. There has been brokenness in our world, again, all the way back to Adam and Eve and their act of rebellion. How do we fix this? What's the solution? How do we solve this problem of sin? And again, I'd say, as I already mentioned, sort of the world's mindset, and this even sort of goes all the way back to sort of enlightenment times and sort of that, that way of thinking is, well, man is capable of so much if we just work at things and, and, and if we just sort of apply ourselves and, and sort of the best of mankind just sort of comes together, we, we can solve any problem. We can work through anything and we can make this wonderful, perfect, utopian world and everything will be wonderful. Sort of man can be the solution to all of these problems of sin and brokenness. That's the world's way of thinking. Well, it hasn't really worked out. If you even just look practically speaking, 
You know, if we look at the last whole century in existence, the 20th century, that's the century with more war and death and devastation in it than any other. It doesn't seem like we're progressing. It doesn't seem like man's just getting better and better and we're working together and things are getting, getting better. No, it seems like it's devolving. Things are getting worse and worse, right? We see man's sin on display. Man isn't the solution. It's not like if we just sort of uh, can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, we can just solve all of the problems, all of the brokenness in the world, right? We're not the solution. Again, I'll talk about that we can, in a sense, have a role in it, but fundamentally, we aren't the solution. We can't just say, man can tackle this, we can do it on our own, right? We're the problem. We're the reason it's all broken. We're not going to be the ones to go and fix it on our own. But there is a solution. It's not like there's no hope. There's just this sin problem and, and we're stuck in it and there's no hope. That's not the reality. But there is hope. There is one who can solve it all, fix it all, and it is Christ himself. It is the Lord. And, and what I want to sort of take a look at and speak to is, in a sense, look at both the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense and, and, and sort of say that Christ has, in a sense, already solved the problem, past tense, at the same time, he sort of is in the present tense solving the problem of sin in the world. And then ultimately, future tense, he, he will with finality solve this problem of sin in the world. And I want to take a look at Scripture and show this and show how Christ is the solution for the problem of sin. Again, past tense, present tense, future tense. And first I want to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And I'll read it for us here. It says... This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Right here, we're sort of thinking of the, the past tense uh, uh, solution or solving of this problem of sin, right? We're stuck in our sin. Think of sin, and not just sin itself, but it's every consequence and effect, all of the fallout of sin. Because of sin, we're separated from God. We're rightfully under his just judgment, Right? And, and the reality is Christ has solved that problem of, of sin and its effects in the sense of it separating us from God and placing us under his judgment. What did he do? How did he solve this problem past tense? Well, he came. He came to this world. He took our place. He took the place of sinful man, took our sins, and paid the penalty for it. He made atonement for sin so that ultimately all who repent and believe in him might be forgiven. The stain of our sins washed away. Be reconciled to God and have everlasting life. For all of us who trust in Christ with true saving faith, we're forgiven. We're restored to God, made into a, having a right relationship with him, made right with him. We have eternal life in him. And so Christ, by coming here, making atonement for sin, he has solved the problem of sin in regard to its, its legal hold on us and over us, right? Separating us from God, placing us under the wrath of God. Christ has solved that. He came, he made atonement for sin. But you could look at that and say, okay, he has solved it. But at the same time, we can still sort of look at our own lives, even as, as people who are followers of Christ, uh, who've trusted in him, who've been forgiven of sins. We can look at our own lives. So we can also just look at the world all around us and say, well, sin's still present, right? I still struggle with sin. We all still struggle with sin. We look at the world around us, and, and, and again, we see it at all times, certainly particularly on display lately. We see sin all around. And so we say, well, you know, it's been solved in some sense, solved in some sense, but yet the problem still exists, and in other sense as well. We still see sin at work all over the place. And the reality is, yes, Christ has solved the problem of sin by making atonement for it, but he is also currently actively solving, present tense, the problem of sin in the world right here, right now. And one of the ways in which we see this is in regard to sanctification. And in fact, we're going to turn to a passage that I believe we read last week. It's 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Put simply right, yep, we, we have forgiveness in Christ, and in fact, we've been made into a new creation, right? We have a new heart, but, but we still struggle with sin. But, it, but it's not like... We're stuck in that sin that still lingers in us and we sort of have no hope of victory over it, but that's not the reality. But the Holy Spirit, day after day, moment after moment, is sanctifying us, ever increasingly molding us into the likeness of Christ. And this is at the direction of Christ. In Christ, at, the, at Christ himself, at his direction, the Holy Spirit is in our lives molding us into Christ's likeness, into his image, right? And so 
every moment, day after day, the sin that still lingers in us, that problem is being solved. That sin, bit by bit, is being put to death, is being purged from us, is being removed from us, and we are both being molded ever increasingly into the likeness of Christ and ever increasingly having victory over the sin that sort of still lingers and remains in us. And so Christ is, right, through the Holy Spirit, He is solving, actively solving and, and conquering and triumphing over the sin that still lingers in believers. Right? But again, you could also still say, well, let's look at the world around us. Right? How about sort of actively solving the problem of sin and its brokenness in the world all around us? Well, part of it is, 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 is the Lord sends out his faithful people to go and bring the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And more people hear that message and repent and believe in the Lord and trust in him. What, what winds up happening? Well, sin is, is being defeated. Christ is triumphing over sin as more and more people day after day are entering into the kingdom Christ is dealing with the problem of sin in the world as he, as he conquers sin and its hold over people's lives, holding them under the judgment of God, but also as they repent and they believe and they trust in the Lord, they're made into a new creation and have a new heart, a repentant heart, a heart for the Lord. And then they begin that process of, of continued sanctification over the rest of their life until one day they're made perfect. And so uh, as the gospel moves forward, not just in the lives of believers as sanctification takes place is sort of uh, the sin problem in the world being dealt with, but also as the gospel message moves forward as more people enter into the kingdom, again, sin is being conquered and defeated, uh, and that sin problem in the world is continually being solved and dealt with by the Lord. But also, uh, we see this, and I want to now turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. We see also that, and this is where we see where while Christ is the solution, it doesn't mean that he never works through humans as he is the solution in regard to the sin problem and the brokenness all around us. Uh, Christ does still delight in using people in certain ways. And here we're going to be talking about Christ using his people as peacekeepers, right? As we see a world that is broken before us in, in a whole host of ways, we as God's people are to go and, and reflecting his character as a peacekeeper. God's a peacekeeper. That's why he sent his son to go and make peace between God and man. And we as his children are to go and be peacekeepers. And where we see brokenness to go and, and be a mediator in those situations. To seek to bring wholeness. Again, not that we're doing it on our own power. Like, hey, look at, look at all I can accomplish as a peacekeeper. It's going to be God who does the work. But he still delights in using us. And so we are called to go and be, be peacekeepers. And we see this, this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. I know I've said peacekeepers. I mean peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What's, what's being said here, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I don't want us to misunderstand this and think the sense of, well, okay, we're, we're to be a peacemaker. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Does that mean somehow this is some sort of works-based salvation? Like if we go and we're a peacemaker, well, then somehow we'll earn this status of sonship with God. That's not at all what's being said. That, that's not the sense of it. But rather, being a peacemaker is sort of the, the very natural fruit of real saving faith, right? When we come to faith in the Lord, we're transformed, we're given a new heart, we're a new creation in Christ. And, and this new character we have is, is really Christ-like character. Not that it's, it's perfect Christ-likeness, right? We still need that sanctification as we're ever increasingly molded into the likeness of Christ. But in that moment of conversion, we are made into a new creation and, and in great ways reflect the character of Christ. And so being a peacemaker is, in a sense, good evidence and sort of demonstration of real saving faith in that individual. And it's through that real saving faith that one then has the status of child of God, of son of God, daughter of God. And so certainly those who are peacemakers, they are blessed ones, for they will be called and indeed are God's children, right? And that peacemaking is just sort of uh, evidence of real saving faith. But there's also a sense in which what's being said here in regard to children of God or sons of God is the sense of sort of reflecting the Father's character. Those who are peacemakers, who belong to, to the Lord, they are His, right? They're His people, they are His children. It's natural for children to reflect the character of their Father. And so just as the Father is a peacemaker, and I already mentioned this, He's a peacemaker. He sent His Son to come and make peace at great cost to Himself, to make peace between God and man, where we were separated from God because of sin, he sent his son to go and bring about peace, uh, to go and make peace. And if we are God's children, it's only natural that we reflect our father's character. 
And if he's a peacemaker, then we are to be peacemakers as well as God's people. Now, I understand that this isn't in the imperative. It's not like it says, be a peacemaker. It just says, speaks of a reality. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. But it's, it's certainly implicit here that God's people are to go and reflect his character and be peacemakers, right? We as God's people are to do that, are to be that. We are to go out into the world as peacemakers and seek to bring wholeness where there is brokenness, right? Again, not that it's, it's sort of our work done on our effort as though we can accomplish it on human strength alone. It's going to be God who's going to bring the wholeness, who's going to bring the peace, but he delights in using us as his people, as peacemakers. And so, uh, you know, in a sense... What does this entail? If we're really going to be peacemakers in the world, if we're really going to say, hey, we want to reflect our Father's character. He's a peacemaker. He made peace between himself and us. We want to go out into a world that is characterized by, by not peace, but, but brokenness, and we want to see peace take place. We want to make peace in a broken world. We want to see wholeness take place. What is that going to look like? I'd say first and foremost, it's going to involve prayer, right? We just need to be praying. Whether we think of our current situation now and sort of the brokenness or really in any time, in any brokenness, to recognize God's going to be the one who's going to bring the wholeness to that situation. And as we see the brokenness, to say, as one who's a peacemaker, we just got to pray. We got to pray for God to be at work and that he would work through us and use us and that he would just bring wondrous wholeness where there's brokenness as he delights in doing we also need to, to be mediators. The reality is, is all too often when there's issues or there's friction, uh, you know, in whatever scenario, it's easy to sort of be like, I don't want to get in the middle of that, you know. It's between him and him. I don't want to stick myself in the middle and somehow I'll shoot myself in the foot. I'll become the bad guy. It's easy to sort of just want to stay out of it and, and let it play out. But that's not what it is to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker recognizes the brokenness and just wants to see peace and wholeness take place. And so he's willing to get involved as a third party and, and seek to bring the two parties together and bring wholeness where there is division and brokenness. Right? But, but maybe you're not a third party in some sort of situation and conflict and brokenness. Maybe you're either the one who's committed some sort of offense and caused the brokenness, or maybe someone's done something to you. Again, what, what does a, a peacemaker do in those situations? Well, if someone's wronged you, you extend forgiveness, and you just keep on loving and showing kindness. That's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker isn't going to withhold forgiveness and say, I'm just going to hold that against you, and I'm going to respond with hatred and bitterness and just sort of cause you know, this wound to just fester and become worse and worse. No, even if you've wronged me, I'm just going to forgive you. I'm just going to love you uh, and just show you kindness. That's what a peacemaker does. But maybe you're the one who's done wrong. Even for good peacemakers, we mess up, right? And, and, and we do wrong at times. Again, what does a peacemaker do in those situations? Well, a peacemaker is going to acknowledge wrongdoing. Hey, if I messed up, I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to apologize for it. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to do my part to set things right and bring wholeness to a broken situation. Right? And speaking of sort of mediating conflict, prayer, forgiving and loving and, and asking for forgiveness if you've done wrong, not only does a, a peacemaker do these things, but a peacemaker also models it for others and, and models it for a broken world. It says, not just am I going to do this, but see how I live my life, see how I respond, see how I live as a peacemaker and reflect that same type of behavior and to show to the world, this is what the church ought to be doing, is showing the rest of the world what it looks like to be a peacemaker, to make peace where this brokenness. And again, I don't want us to understand this as though this is some human effort. It's going to be God who's at work in us and through us bringing the wholeness, but he delights in working in and through us toward this end. But, but I want to talk not just about sort of the past tense, Christ has triumphed over sin. He has solved this problem, making atonement for sin. He is solving it, present tense in the world, right? As we talked about in sanctification, uh, certainly even using his, his, his children as peacemakers in the world, bringing peace to a broken world as he works in and through them. But I also want to talk about future tense as well. Because again, you could still look at, at things as they are now and say, even as, as Christ has past tense sort of defeated sin and dealt with this problem, even as he is dealing with it currently now, there's just still so much brokenness. And to say, is there going to be a day when it's all done and over with, where, where man's sin and all of the, the consequences, all of the fallout from that, that is there going to be a day when that is no more or will it endure forever? Is there a lasting, once and for all, final solution to this problem of man, his sinfulness, his depravity, his evil? And the answer is there is a 
once and for all, fix and solution with finality. Christ will come, future tense. He will return to this earth. And when he does, here, when he does here's what he's going to do. Right? He's going to wage war against evil, against the devil, against his evil forces. He will cast the devil, his demons, and all of the wicked who have rebelled against the Lord and rejected him. He will cast them into the fires of hell. I know our world doesn't like to hear that news and that reality, but it's true. But not only will he do that, not only will he deal with the wicked and give them their just judgment, but he will do away with every bit of consequence and fallout from sin, every imperfection, pain, suffering, death, every imperfection as a result that has resulted from sin, all of that brokenness, it will be done away with. Again, with finality, it will be no more. Christ will usher in when he returns the new created order, right? This, this current order of things characterized by brokenness in, in, in all sorts of ways, it will be no more. There will be a new created order and it will be perfect. No more sin. No more pain, no more suffering, no more death, right? All of that stuff done away with, it will be perfect and glorious. And here's what scripture says about it. This is Revelation chapter 21, verses one through four. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed. For her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Right? This is the, the new created order that will be ushered in. We will dwell with God in the fullness of his presence and glory. We will dwell with him, see him face to face. What a wondrous joy, what a glorious inheritance. In every imperfection, right, it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, mourning, crying, pain, the old order of things, right? It will have passed away. Everything will be glorious and perfect. We will be made perfect. We will no longer sin anymore. We will no longer struggle with it. And every bit of imperfection will be done away with, right? Christ, when he returns, will with finality deal with the problem of the sinfulness of man, man's evil, man's depravity, and it's every consequence and brokenness. He will with finality deal with it, right? And so now I want to kind of come back big picture and say, what's sort of our takeaway? What's our application? First, I want us to understand this. I want us to really understand the horrific extent of man's sinfulness and depravity. Because we, we really truly live in a culture that sort of downplays that. And it even has a way at times of filtering into sort of the Christian world as well and filtering into the church where it's sort of like we downplay man's sinfulness. You know, yeah, we mess up. We sort of slip up. We do some wrong things from time to time. But hey, I'm still pretty good. I'm, I'm mostly good. I'm not so bad. That's sort of our natural way of thinking. But the reality is far different, and I want us to really understand the the horrific depths and extent of man's sinfulness and depravity. As Jeremiah says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately, incurably sick, diseased. Who can understand it, right? That is our condition. That's the reality of mankind, man's sinful nature, right? We are utterly, totally depraved, sinful, evil creatures. To understand that, and to recognize we can't fix this problem on our own. We can't just say, we just got to come together and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, just apply ourselves, do what we as people can do, and we'll fix it. But to recognize, no, we're, we're the problem. Our, our sinfulness is the reason why every bit of brokenness here exists. And God is the solution, not me, not man. God is, Christ is. He has solved this problem, he is solving it, and he will with finality solve it, to really understand that and and to know it and and to celebrate Christ as the only solution to this problem of sin, just to celebrate that he has solved this, he is solving it, he will solve it with finality, to give him thanks and worship him and praise him, and just to delight in his triumph over sin in which we share, we share in that triumph. But then I also want to talk about being a peacemaker as I have Again, it's Christ's work, it's God's work to to deal with the brokenness of sin. Uh, Again, past, present, and future tense. But he still invites us in certain ways into the process to seek to bring 
wholeness in our world, peace in our world, to be those peacemakers as we see brokenness, to, to have a role, even if it is God's work, in bringing wholeness to the world. And I want to see not just New Hope Chapel, I want to see the church everywhere, throughout the U.S., throughout the whole world, really live out what it is to be peacemakers, to really reflect God's own character in that way, to recognize He is a peacemaking God. He is a God who delights in wholeness and peace and brings it to pass, who delights in bringing wholeness. He is a peacemaker, and we are to do the same. Right? We are to reflect that character. And I want to see us as God's people live that out powerfully, to, to just pray for it day after day, that just where there's brokenness in our world, that God would just move mightily and bring healing and work through us and just bring peace in those situations. Again, to be willing to be a mediator wherever there's brokenness, in any and every situation, whether it's sort of uh, something that sort of grips the whole nation and divides a nation, or whether it's just two individuals who are at odds with one another because someone's done something and has hurt, just to be willing to be a mediator, that third party, and get involved and say, hey, I want to see wholeness here. I want to see reconciliation, right? I don't want to see strife and division and hate and just to be that wondrous peacemaking mediator, to be willing to forgive and love as people wrong us, and as we commit wrongs, as we will at times, for sure, to, to acknowledge our wrongdoing, to ask for forgiveness, to do our part to set things right, and for God's church as a whole to really show the way to the rest of the world, to model this for the world to see and say, this is what we are to live out. This is what God delights in. He delights in wholeness, not brokenness, and he delights in seeing people pursue peace and wholeness in the world. And so I want to challenge us to really faithfully live that out and be peacemakers for the blessing and benefit of the world, but most importantly, for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we readily acknowledge our brokenness, our sinfulness. We know our hearts are desperately, incurably sick, diseased with sin. We can't cure ourselves. We can't solve the problem ourselves. But Lord Jesus, you have solved it. You came. You made atonement for sin. You are solving it actively in our world right here, right now. As your kingdom grows and moves forward, as sanctification is taking place in the lives of your people, and as your people go forth into the world as peacekeepers, peacemakers, Lord, reflecting your character. Not only just past and present tense, but also future tense. You will, will with finality, deal with the problem of our sin and its every effect and consequence and brokenness you will come back, and how we long for that day. You will come back and do away with every imperfection, wage war against evil, against sin, do away with those imperfections and usher in the new created order where we will dwell with you in the fullness of your glory and presence. And there'll be no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more hurt, no more death. No more imperfection of any sort, and it will just be glorious, perfect, and how we long for that day, O oh Lord, when you return and set everything right. And may we know that you are the solution to it all, and may we celebrate you as the only solution, Lord Jesus. May we give you thanks for being a solution for us steeped in our sin solving the problem we couldn't. And may we just worship you and praise you, our great and glorious God, in whose name we pray, amen. Now we're gonna take some time to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this is something that, that I just delight in celebrating with all of you. If you're watching online, this is your chance. If you haven't already to go and grab your bread, you know, run into the kitchen, grab some bread, get your grape juice or wine and, and get it all ready. Uh, if you're here in the sanctuary, if you didn't grab one when you came in, at the back, at the corners where the bulletins are, there are these little sort of like all-inclusive communion sets with the little bread and, and the grape juice. You can go and uh, grab one for yourself. 
uh, and that way you'll be ready to, to celebrate this with us. But, but this is just such a wondrous, wondrous blessing to celebrate this. Even as we've talked about Christ, we've talked about uh, really his victory and triumph over sin, over that problem, you know, that has plagued mankind, how he has solved it, right? And, and here we are remembering and celebrating that, his atoning death on the cross, whereby he solved this problem of sin, where he triumphed over it. He made atonement for our sin. And this is something we do just to remember, to acknowledge, to celebrate our Lord, our Savior, and his atoning death. And so if you're a follower of Christ, Christ commands all of his followers to partake of this. If you're a follower of Christ, then please join us in this. Whether you're here, whether you're online watching, uh, join us in celebrating this and celebrating our great God and his wondrous work on the cross. Uh, but if you just aren't there yet, you're just not ready to give your life to the Lord to say, I, I believe and I'm all in. I'm yours, Lord Jesus. I repent. I trust in you. Maybe you just have your doubts, your hesitations. You're just not quite ready to take that step. If that's you, we just politely ask you to refrain just from this one part of our service, uh, not because we just want to keep you at arm's length or exclude you. That, that's by no means what it is. But, but rather, this is something Christ commands his followers alone to celebrate as a celebration of what he has done for us. So if you're just not ready to follow the Lord, just politely ask you to refrain just from this one part uh, of our service. And before we do partake of the Lord's Supper, we, we first want to come before the Lord in prayer and confess our sins. So please join with me in prayer. Lord God, what a joy it is, a delight to celebrate this, your supper, Lord Jesus. And as we come before you, God, we acknowledge our sinfulness. It's something we have just talked about in our sermon. We know ever since the fall, ever since that first act of sin and rebellion, mankind has been plagued by sin. We were born into sin, conceived in a sinful state. Our hearts are desperately sick, incurably sick and diseased in rebellion to you. And we deserve your just punishment and wrath. Lord, we know we failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We failed to love you wholeheartedly. We have lived out our sinful nature day in, day out with acts of rebellion. Lord, and we are sorry. We mourn over our sinfulness, all of the ways that we have dishonored you. We repent of it, and we turn to you, looking to you for forgiveness, knowing we have it. Lord, that is what we've even talked about in our sermon. We have forgiveness. And you have triumphed over sin, dealing with its legal consequences. You are triumphing over sin in our lives, even as it lingers and remains. And you will one day with finality triumph over it and deal with it once and for all and make it no more. And Lord, we are just grateful for de your delivering us from sin and its every effect. We thank you for the forgiveness and the life everlasting that we have in you. As we take a, a moment of silence in this prayer, we, each and every one of us as individuals, confess to you our specific, personal, individual sins. confess these personal sins again warning over them repenting of our sinfulness looking to you for forgiveness and knowing we have it and basking in it delighting in it rejoicing in the forgiveness that we have in you lord jesus and we thank you and praise you for it now and forevermore in your name we pray amen scripture says that the lord jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So now let us partake of this, the Lord's Supper, to celebrate, to honor, to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his atoning death for us. The body and blood of Christ for you. Eat this bread and drink this cup, remembering our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how his body was broken and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the joy of this celebration. Thank you all the more so for what it is all about. Your love in action. You going to a cross, doing for us what we could never accomplish, taking our place, the wrath that we deserve, that we might, by grace through faith, be forgiven, saved, reconciled to you, have everlasting life. We so very much do not deserve it, yet you graciously pour out life and forgiveness upon us. We thank you for it. We praise you for it, Lord. And may we do so not just now, but forevermore into eternity. In your name we pray. Amen.
We'll have right after the service our virtual fellowship time on Zoom, so you can tune in there if you'd uh, just like to spend some time with brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now let's close with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.